Good evening again, everybody. Sorry to wake you up there rather suddenly with the microphone. Um, a very warm welcome to you this evening to the 2023 Winder Lecture. Welcome to members and friends of Warfield Church. Welcome to visitors from across the deanery and the diocese. It's good to have you with us. Welcome to... Um, those who have come from furthest afield. I know we were expecting some people from Chesham. I don't know whether they've made it. Have we got any? Che yes, we have. Welcome from Chesham. So thank you for making such a long journey. Um, and welcome to the Mayor of the Borough of Bracknell Forest. It's very good to have Councillor Nahid Ijaz with us this evening. So thank you for coming and being with us. And of course, most particularly, welcome to Bishop Olivia, who is here to give our lecture this evening. Now we understand that in the year 1647, Thomas Winder, a citizen and grocer of London, instigated a sermon to be preached at the church of St. Michael the Archangel on the Sunday nearest to Guy Fawkes Day. Uh, we are in the Church of St. Michael the Angel. We're not quite on the Sunday nearest to Guy Fawkes Day, but we're, we're not bad. Um, and every year we invite an eminent speaker to address an area of contemporary concern. So, Bishop Olivia, we are very glad to have an eminent speaker with us this evening um, to speak to us about caring for God's good earth. We are going to be recording the lecture this evening. It'll be on video recording. Um, it shouldn't include any of us who are sitting in the audience. I think unless Andy and I sort of stand up and wave our hands in front of Bishop Olivia, we should be all right. Uh, but do just be aware that when we come to the question and answer session a little later in the evening, it will be being recorded. Uh, that'll be audio recording, not, not video. We won't sort of be bringing the camera around, uh, but do just be mindful of that um, when we come to that part of the evening. So without further ado, let me hand over to Bishop Olivia to come and speak to us about caring for God's good earth. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Oh, ooh, had a bit. that's all right, we'll adjust that. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming out this evening. I always think that um, this particular night of the year the night after the clocks go back, uh, is one in which I have the instinct to hunker down with some hot chocolate and just never go out again. Because I'm, <laughs> And I'm really impressed by the number of people that are here this evening. It's very good of you to come. Um, some of you may have um, heard me speak before on this subject. Um, some of what I'm going to say will probably be um, what you've heard before. Um, because uh, there isn't an awful lot new to say about it, but we do need to keep saying it. And I will try to speak without too much uh, repetition, hesitation, or deviation. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is to speak, I think, for about 40 minutes, um, to give you some thoughts about the climate and wider environmental crisis that we're in, um, to think about how we got here, what spiritual challenges lie at the root of it and what we need to pay attention to in order that we can get out of it and continue to flourish as human beings. Um, after I've finished speaking, we'll have time for um, uh, Q&A, uh, any comments that you'd like to make. I'd be very glad to hear them. Um, uh, and Catherine will come round with a microphone. So we'll, we'll just play that by ear. And when we have had enough, we'll uh, go home. So, let's think about facing up to where we are. This is the big one. It's the one which presents us with an urgent and existential challenge. It's the one which we've ignored for far too long, hoping that it will go away, or that the scientists have been mistaken, hoping that the maths is wrong, or that the now regular fury of the heat waves, the bushfires, the tornadoes, the storms, and the floodwaters is just a blip, and that normal climate service will be resumed next year or the year after. Well, sadly, it turns out that the science is accurate. The sums do add up, and the extreme weather events are not only here to stay, but to increase in ferocity whatever we do. This is the new normal, and there is no returning to the climate stability 
we've enjoyed for the past 10,000 years or so. You may be familiar with the climate stripes, which were created by Professor Ed Hawkins at the National Centre for Atmospheric Science at the University of Reading. He did this work in 2018, and it's been very widely picked up as a, as a, a clever and useful pictorial way of helping people to understand where we are. It's a data set. This data set is for Berkshire, and each stripe represents a year. It begins in 1863 and goes on through to last year, 2022. The blue stripes show years in which the average temperature for the year has been below the average temperature for the whole period. And the red stripes show years in which the average temperature for that year has been above the average temperature for the whole period. And where the stripes start to turn red is the year 1990. The last stripe, as I said, is for 2022, a year in which the UK saw temperatures of more than 40 degrees for the first time. Last year, we were in a La Nina phase in the Pacific, which helped to hold the temperatures down. This year, we're starting to see a return of a neutral or warming phase called El Nino, and the very darkest red stripes will return as temperatures are pushed up. We won't have seen the full effects of the El Nino um, this year, but it will start to really kick in next year. Professor Hawkins says this, the message is clear. Excess heat is building up across the planet at a rate unprecedented in the history of humanity. If you think how hot 2022 was, and then realize that those 12 months will likely be one of the coolest years of the rest of our lives, we will regret not having acted sooner on these warnings. I'll say some more about the scale and scope of the crisis that we're in in a minute. But first I want to say something about common responsibility and social cohesion. You'll note I've got my water in a plastic bottle. I've had this bottle for about seven years, so it's doing good service. Before I was ordained, I worked in Africa and spent quite a lot of time with pastoralists. Pastoralism is a production system which enables a group of people to utilize arid and semi-arid lands where the rainfall is too low for, for crop production by herding livestock. They herd high value animals like cattle and camels, which are the main stores of wealth for the community, and small stock, sheep and goats, more used for daily consumption. The animals provide pastoralists with a store of wealth and cash when needed, with meat, milk, hides, blood, and also a means of forming and sealing relationships. They have enormous cultural significance. Pastoralism is a highly efficient way of enabling marginal land to support life, culture, and community. Now, pastoralism depends on common access to grazing and common access to permanent water sources for use in the dry season. If these are available and accessible, then it is possible to exploit a vast area of grazing during the wet season. But if the dry season water becomes unavailable because it's been privatized, for example, then the system collapses. This period of my life was formative for me because it brought me into close touch with the land, the environment, the essentials of life and community, of fragility and strength, and the whole notion of what it means for a group of people, a community, a society, a nation, a world, to utilize a common, one might say God-given, resource in such a way that everybody benefits. And it made me aware of the dangers which individual selfishness or self-interest can pose to the common good. You may be familiar with the expression, the tragedy of the commons. Anybody heard of that? 
one or two. It was first coined in 1833 by a man called William Lloyd, who focused on the problem of overuse of English common land, where villagers graze their cows. For each additional animal, a villager could receive additional benefits, while the whole group shared the resulting damage to the common. And if all the villagers made individually rational decisions, the common could be depleted or even destroyed to the detriment of everyone. Now, this idea was picked up again in an extraordinarily influential article by Gareth Harden in 1968, an article with the same title. And although his article focused heavily on the issue of population growth, it laid out the commons dilemma. And it's been very widely picked up as a way of analyzing a great variety of resource allocation problems in today's world. Water, forests, fish, fossil fuels, and the general issue of environmental sustainability. In the face of our global environmental emergency, we're facing <clears throat> our biggest ever challenge to make the commons work. The collective use, protection, and management of our commonly owned planetary resources, land, water, oceans, and everything they contain, fossil fuels, the very air that we breathe. Now, the thing about the commons is that it is perfectly possible for a group of people to use a commonly held resource in a sustainable way, as the nomadic pastoralists of Africa have done for centuries, regardless of what economic theory would have us believe about our drive towards individual self-interest. As long as there are shared social structures and relationships, shared belief systems or formal rules which govern access and use, then all is well. But if you disrupt or remove the shared social structures, if you fail to agree on the rules, the common enterprise cannot succeed. And this has started to happen in a big way in the East African rangelands and elsewhere, where privatization of water resources um, has become normal. Governments uh, encouraged by the World Bank, undergirded by a particular economic philosophy and combined with a deep suspicion of nomadic people have issued individual land title to allow enclosure and privatization of the rangelands. So common access to water has been lost and the gap between the rich and the poor has grown. The wealthy have benefited. Thousands have become destitute. This is perhaps the true tragedy of the commons, the disruption of a sense of responsibility for each other. Rowan Williams, in his little book called Being Human, talks of the uncooperative self. He says that labor, production, business have all moved away from a sense of belonging with each other and taking responsibility for each other. As individuals, we want to be more and more in control and we're uncomfortable with limits so we exploit the environment, and we seek and expect ever greater prosperity. We long for perfection in our bodies, in our marriages, in our jobs, in our homes. But, Rowan says, cooperation is actually hardwired in us for survival, and it can be reclaimed. But only by a systematic challenge to assumptions about what a human being is a person forged in relationship with others, whose essential worth, like that of all others, comes from the fact that we are seen by and engaged with love. The sense of being a person in and through our relationship with others is at the heart of the concept of Ubuntu, which you'll be very familiar with, I'm sure. I exist in and through you. A person is a person through other people. Ubuntu has its roots in the idea of community as one of the building blocks of society. It suggests common humanity, oneness, shared interest, empathy, concern, love. 
Without love, we are nothing. We need to take a long, hard look at what on earth we are doing to creation. In the last 400 generations, humankind has inhabited the Holocene Age. This was a benign and stable climate which saw the human race go from the scattered tribes of spear carriers and fire raisers who emerged from their caves at the end of the last ice age to become the first farmers, metallurgists, urban dwellers, industrialists, to now the nearly 8 billion inhabitants of a digitized, globalized world. We are now, friends, in the Anthropocene age, the age in which we human beings and our activity has a significant effect on the Earth's ecosystems. It dates from the time of the Industrial Revolution when we began to burn fossil fuels at scale. And one extremely dangerous aspect of this, of course, is anthropogenic climate change. Our current level of warming is about 1.2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And this already has significant impacts on our weather systems. The International Panel for Climate Change, IPCC, has issued a series of reports and its projections about what happens when we pass 1.5 degrees and head towards 2 degrees signal severe and widespread impacts. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, which we must do if we are able to avoid irreversible change, would require us to halve our global carbon emissions by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. But 1.5 degrees as a target is on life support, as Alok Sharma put it at the COP26 two years ago. And indeed, this year, the World Meteorological Office issued a report that projected a significant likelihood, 66%, that the world would exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, in the next four years. Our action to date on this has been, quite frankly, feeble. And our inaction has been entrenched. We seem to be spectacularly hidebound by our determination that nothing should get in the way of me living my life as I want to. And there's now a very real danger of runaway warming as a series of tipping points are reached and surpassed and the feedback loops take over. There's very strong evidence that this is starting to happen. The acceleration of melting ice at the poles is, is destabilizing the great ice sheets, causing sea level rise by sea levels to rise by several meters over a few decades and this is going to happen whatever we do the melting ice interrupts the north atlantic ocean circulation which then alters global weather patterns including the gulf stream which warms our islands and ultimately switches off the asian monsoon season and as the land warms in the polar regions frozen methane which is a a greenhouse gas far more potent than carbon dioxide will bubble up out of the melting Siberian permafrost in volumes which will raise the global temperatures by several more degrees. This is potentially a disaster for the human race and for many other species. And it's not a natural disaster. It's one caused by human agency. All over the world, people are already being forced to reassess the viability of the places they call home. The low-lying islands are the first to face this reality. Already some have been submerged by rising seas and the people who live on them have been forced to leave their homes and move to other places. We all have our light bulb moments on these issues. My most recent one was hearing that the Amazon, the lungs of the planet, is now a net emitter of carbon dioxide. The effects of our abuse on the commons of the planet, the air, the water, the soil, the forests, the oceans, is now apparent to all of us. Whether we live 
uh, in a part of the world where toxic smog hits us in the face every time we step outside, or where the countryside surrounding us for miles is charred and smoking, or where houses and whole villages are swept away by torrential floodwaters or mudslides, or where we cannot grow our staple crops through the absence of rainfall, or where extreme heat and the wet bulb effect is actually hazardous to human life, wherever we are no longer in any kind of ignorant bubble. Let's talk about biodiversity. Climate warming is, of course, part of a much greater crisis. Biodiversity is essential to human survival. The biodiversity of our planet is the result of 3.8 billion years of evolution. The UN's 2019 Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity, which is one of the most comprehensive studies of the health of the planet ever conducted, tells us that due to the human impact on the environment in the past half century, the Earth's biodiversity has suffered a catastrophic decline, unprecedented in human history. We are headed for a sixth mass, distinct, mass extinction. In the last half century, here are some shocking statistics coming up, warn, I warn you. In the last half century, about 50% of the world's animals have been lost. Of all the mammals left on Earth, only 4% are now wild mammals. 36% are humans, and a whopping 60% are now livestock. 70% of all the bird biomass on the planet is now made up of poultry. More than 40% of insect species are declining, and a third are endangered. And, by the way, three quarters of the crop types we grow rely on insect pollination. We are in an age where our impact as a species is having a catastrophic effect on the species we share this planet with. And the irony of this is that we need this biodiversity to ensure our own flourishing. We rely on nature far more than we know or admit for food, for building materials, for warmth, for textiles, for the active ingredients in medicines, and much, much more. And there are other vital functions that nature provides. The filtering of air and water, the enrichment of soil, and protection against floods. Our human existence in the current age is at serious risk because of our increasingly rapid destruction of the very systems that support life on Earth. Unfortunately, all too often, we forget what nature gives us. In our industrialized societies, biodiversity is something simply taken for granted and seen as something free and eternal. It's treated as an externality in economic models. But the reality is that because of the way that we now live, many human activities are posing a major threat to thousands of species through the destruction and fragmentation of their habitats, through pollution of air, water, and land, overfishing, overuse of forests and agricultural land, the introduction of non-native species, and of course, the release of increasing amounts of greenhouse gases that cause climate change. Now, we are not as many of us would like to think, a species which stands at the apex of a pyramid of creation. We're in fact an integral part of a highly sophisticated web of life on Earth, which operates as a complex adaptive system. What happens in one part of it impacts all of the other parts, for good or ill, and some of these impacts are not immediately apparent. Our human actions in the last half century have largely been for ill. And it doesn't take us long to see that many of the pressures which we're subjecting the system to are in fact symptoms of a wide and deep set of issues. Unsustainable patterns of consumption, demographic change, globalization, and I would suggest a deep, deep spiritual crisis. The challenge we face is not simply a technological one. Part of its solution may emerge from technology and scientific advancement, 
But listen to the words of Gus Speth, the former dean of Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. These words are now much quoted and you may well have heard them before. Gus Speth said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And we scientists don't know how to deal with this. What we need is a spiritual and cultural transformation. Interesting words coming from a scientist. I would suggest that we are here because we've become separated from, alienated from, the rest of creation that surrounds us. We've come to treat it as us and them, or us and it. We've lost sight of the integrated nature of things. I consider myself to have been hugely fortunate to spend several years in Africa living in a mud hut with no running water and a long drop out the back, eating a very simple, repetitive diet which was already much richer than that of the people around me, and witnessing at first hand a deep connection which is both practical and spiritual between people and their land. If you meet someone in the streets of Nairobi, for example, and ask where their home is, they won't tell you about the shack in the township on the edge of the city. They'll tell you where their land is, their shamba, or where their animals are. It's where their maize crop is growing. It's where their relatives are buried. They may live in the city, but it's not their home. And for those living in the rural areas, they know that if you don't plant, or the rain doesn't fall, or the insects get out of control, or the goats get in, then you won't eat. At the COP26 in Glasgow, which I attended in 2021, as generally in global conversations, the voices and the wisdom of indigenous people struggle to be heard. But these voices are vital to our health. They are profound and prophetic. They are deeply connected to and integrated with the natural world. I listened to an Aboriginal pastor, an Anglican priest, telling of how white people have treated his people, have displaced them from their land, have separated children from their parents, have forced them into re-education into Western ways, have denigrated their culture and their spirituality, and of how his people still walk backwards into the future, bringing with them the wisdom and understanding drawn from 60,000 years of deep connection with the living world, ignored, discounted, scorned even. We, in the so-called developed economies, simply don't understand this sense of connection with the natural environment, and it makes it hard for us to connect emotionally with its riches and its fragility. Let's think about greed and enoughness. We have another problem in the rich, developed countries. We have lost sight of how much is enough. We have been programmed, especially in the years since the Second World War, to want more and more stuff, to compare ourselves with others, to keep up with the Joneses, to desire deeply the latest, smoothest, slickest, most pleasing item on the tech list, to discard our clothes, our gadgets, our toys, even our relationships without thought, and to replace them without calculation. We've lost our sense of contentment, and we have become highly individualized in the way that we live our lives and make our choices, ceasing to be aware of the impact our choices have on others and on our common humanity or on our world. Duncan Austin, an economist, in a fascinating essay written recently, traces the evolution of greed over the past three centuries from being a vice to being a virtue. In 1714, Bernard de Mandeville talked about the markets 
seemingly magical power to transmute the individual vice of greed into the virtue of greater good. Not only did the market have the power to neutralize greed, but it required greed as a multiplier of effective demand and hence the driver of the economy. De Mandeville was roundly condemned by his contemporary John Wesley, who considered him to be a latter-day Machiavelli. Of course, it wasn't just Wesley's deeply Christian soul which was disturbed by this movement of thought. Warnings against greed, against excessive pursuit of self-interest, go back centuries into our oldest written traditions and likely long before that into our evolutionary roots because of the unbalancing effect which greed has on our social relationships and on our resource base. Think back to the pastoralists and the issue of common land. 60 years after de Mandeville, Adam Smith softened these presentations and the vice of greed became self-love or self-interest. At the heart of this shift was a major cultural reappraisal of the character of greed and over a relatively short period, human culture flipped from the narrative of greed is bad to an exciting new hypothesis that greed might be okay. And over time, that conviction has grown. And today, there is very little stigma associated with greed. We've been conditioned to want more than we need. When recession looms, we're often exhorted to consume more for the good of the economy, to get back to the high street, to eat out to help out, for example. The wealth accumulations of the very rich are excused by the entrenched narrative that presumes that the wealth that they have earned must be their fair share of the doubtless much greater value they've created for the economy. We have lost sight of the earlier understanding that warnings against greed constituted a very important balancing loop in the complex system of human society. The notion of jubilee. Inequality grows, the fabric of society strains, and of course, the effect on the environment becomes more and more visible and more and more dangerous to human existence. And that leads us, of course, to the issue of justice. The issue of justice lies at the heart of the discussions about the climate and wider environmental crisis. If we don't recognize this, then we won't be able to find the solutions. The cost of, the climate, of climate change uh, is not evenly spread. The poorest populations are, are and will be those which are most affected. 70% of this population, according to the UN, are women and a large percentage of those are younger women. The poorest countries in the world, which did almost nothing to create the crisis, which haven't developed their economies using vast quantities of fossil fuels, and which are now trying to develop their economies and raise the standards of living for their populations, they do not have the economic resources either to pay for mitigation or adaptation measures or to compensate for the loss and damage wrought by our decades of inaction. The principle of justice must be at the very heart of the conversation, and how to put it there is one of the defining questions of our era. Only if we build bridges of human solidarity across the world will we survive as a species. That's what we've learned from COVID. It's been well said that we are in the same storm but not in the same boat. That's been the slogan of Christian Aid's work on climate change. We in the parts of the world which are both prosperous and temperate are already feeling its effects to some extent. We look at the heavy downpours, the flooded streets, and we murmur, ah, global warming. But many millions of women, men and children on our planet in parts of the world which are less prosperous and less able to cope are already feeling the effects of it very acutely. In water shortage, drought, extreme heat, violent tropical storms, flood surges, pest infestation and so on. Where life is already precarious, 
life is very much at risk. I've just returned from South Africa, where wildfires had destroyed half a million hectares of grazing in one area of the Northern Cape this year. And while I was there, I narrowly missed storms so violent that a motorway was washed away and hillsides of housing obliterated. These are matters of life and death. So how shall we move forward? Let's look at our behavior. We have known for decades about this looming crisis, and for decades we have continued to assume that it's someone else's problem. We have collectively taken millions of plane flights and driven billions of miles using fossil fuels. We have eaten a tremendous amount of food cultivated through unsustainable and even dangerous processes. We've wasted unbelievable quantities of energy and water. We have thrown away billions of tons of non-biodegradable materials, polluting our oceans and our land. In practical and social terms, there is no putting this genie back in the bottle. We are simply not going to return to a life of hunter-gathering simplicity and very basic consumption. That ship has already sailed. We are bound up in a highly complex financial and economic web which is global in its reach, albeit there's a lot of discussion about whether global capitalism has in fact reached its limits given its inbuilt insistence on constant growth in a world which has finite natural resources. If you're interested, The Economist, Kate Raworth, has proposed an economic model which has been widely picked up, known as donut economics. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. If you haven't read her book of the same name, I highly recommend it. She addresses these issues head on. But one of the things she points out in her book is that our behavior and our choices are very powerfully influenced by other people's behavior and choices. This partly explains that rise in conspicuous consumption since World War II, as advertising has gained in power and reached further, wider and deeper into our society. Economists have traditionally sought to change people's behavior by changing the relative price of things. But this has often failed to achieve what they had hoped because the price signals are drowned out often by much stronger signals which are coming from social networks. This is, in fact, very good news. There is a power in behaving well. It means that if we make choices which are good and not bad for the environment, and if we do it visibly, and if we talk to others about it, and if enough of us do it, then there is a very real possibility of wider behavior change. We saw it in the way in which driving while under the influence of alcohol has become more and more socially unacceptable. We've started to see it in many aspects of environmental awareness and care. We turn the lights out more often, we sort our rubbish, we grow bee-friendly plants in the garden, or leave parts of it a bit wild, and so on. And we live in a society and a world which is highly, highly networked. I hear people say often, that they feel powerless in the face of such enormous challenges. Interestingly, a recent report from the House of Lords Select Committee on Climate and Environment contained huge encouragement. It said that one third of the reduction in carbon emissions needed by 2035 in this country will come from individual and household behavior change. That means that how we live does make a difference. And it means for each one of us that we need to know how much is enough. It means questioning whether we're excited by or revolted by Black Friday. It means systematically offsetting our carbon when we have to emit it. And it means changing the way that we live. So what's the role of our religious and our faith communities? We are citizens, each with a vote, those of us who are over 18. We are consumers who make decisions, and every day we make choices. We're also people of faith. In fact, 84% of the world's population belongs to a faith community. 
And religion has the power to appeal not only to our minds, but to our souls, which is where the change is most deeply needed. Some faith groups are deeply implicated in this crisis and all have to be deeply implicated in the way out of it. What we need is a major infusion of energy to help faith groups inspire behavioural change for sustainable living because every religion contains guidance about how we should live and the faiths of the world are united in recognising the part that they can play. The mess that we're in is as a direct result of our human failings. We are beings who all too easily slip into greed, self-centeredness, lack of love and compassion, apathy, unwillingness to put anyone else but ourselves at the centre of our universe and of our existence. And often, sad to say, we only pay attention to the well-being of others when it doesn't actually take away anything from our own prosperity and enjoyment when it doesn't actually cost us much. The challenges which we face are outside of us, but they start inside us. We have a sickness in our souls, which needs to be faced. And the sooner we face up to it, the better. We need repentance. That means recognizing the sickness and turning around, turning away from it. We need to refocus on the biblical idea of stewardship of the earth or care for creation. We need to etch onto our brains the line of the Lord's Prayer about daily bread. Give us today our daily bread, what we need for today, our basic essential needs, and pray that all the inhabitants of the planet receive their daily bread, fresh air to breathe, clean water to drink. In other words, the equally shared benefits of the commons. One of the great eco-warriors of our age is the unlikely person of Pope Francis. In 2015, he gave us the encyclical Laudato Si. I'm just going to quote from it. He said, the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. For this reason, the ecological crisis is also a summons to profound interior conversion. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. Three powerful aspects of an ecological conversion that he mentions are first, gratitude for what we have, for whatever opportunities life affords us, and a recognition that the world is God's gift to us. Second, a sense of connection an awareness that we are not disconnected from all the other creatures which inhabit this planet, but are deeply joined to them, and each one of them reflects something of God and has something to teach us. And third, a capacity for wonder, which takes us into a deeper understanding of life. Nature, he says, is filled with words of love, but how can we listen to them amid constant noise interminable and nerve-wracking distractions, or the cult of appearances. Pope Francis goes on to talk about an alternative understanding of how to live our lives, developing ways of living through which we can find the deep enjoyment of being free from obsession with consumption. This is not about what some of our politicians would like to call a hair shirt. It's a radical and positive move towards a freedom which most of us simply don't have, a realisation that less really is more, the capacity to be happy with little, to adopt a simplicity which allows us to be more fully present and alive to each thing and each moment, detached from what we possess and not sad for what we lack. Now, the virtues of sobriety and humility, which the Pope and other faith leaders point to as being the way to freedom and contentment and living life to the full, are, it has to be said, not viewed particularly favorably in our age. And yet their opposites, excess, greed, mastery, will inevitably lead to harm both, uh, will lead us to harm both 
our society and our environment. And individual self-improvement isn't going to be enough. We need to act together. The ecological conversion needed to bring about lasting change is also a community conversion. So we need to regain the conviction that we need each other, Ubuntu, and that we have a shared responsibility, back to that idea of the commons. In short, we need to love God and love each other and the whole created world. Love, Pope Francis says, is also civic and political and is the force which leads us towards building a better world. In this, we will find the locus of climate justice, of limiting global warming, of preserving the natural world and of ending our careless overconsumption and wasteful living. And we need never, never to lose hope. The reality is worrying and it is dangerous, but it's not too late to act. So let's keep before us a picture of a planet which we have worked together to restore, where we have mass planted trees, where we have undergone a clean energy revolution, where we have switched to a largely plant-based diet, where we have a completely different attitude to plastics, where we celebrate localism. We emerge from this crisis as much more mature members of the community of life, good stewards of the land and of creation, and good neighbours to each other, locally and globally. This we can do together. Thank you.